EU telecoms have been facing an uphill battle on profitability at the same time combined with deep investments in the network. Why is it now the time for regulators to act? Well, I think that what's new is that the European Union is recognizing that we're investing a lot of money, but the capacity to continue to invest on, and at the level that's required to meet the digital decade objective of the European Union is not going to be enough. And there's this figure that the Commission recognizes, 200 billion euro gap of investment by 2030, which is just coming out of the, the plans to invest by telecom operators and the gap to what would be needed to cover the entire continent with 5G and fiber. Your return on capital employed wasn't too bad last year, though, 6.7%, a little bit off some of the US operators. What should that look like? Well, I mean, if you're an investor and uh, the return on capital in, in employed is improving, but it's still below our cost of capital. And that's something that's not sustainable in the long run. So that's the, the actually the issue in the industry. We all need to increase our return on capital Otherwise, we're not attractive for investors, and that's a real issue if we want to continue to invest in our in infrastructure and in our industry. What jumped out to me this week, having the, the four telecom CEOs on stage with me, including you, was this approach is antagonistic towards regulators. In the past, we've seen telecoms companies trying to put a friendly face on when interacting with the same regulators that can make their life difficult. So you clearly all feel very passionate about this. But that's because we're used to going to Brussels and, and telling the story. But I think using the exposure of the Mobile World Congress to talk openly about how determined we are on working together to fixing, because we take our share, it's not just a regulator's issue. We also have to improve and innovate better and faster together, being more open, because the telecom ecosystem has not always been fast to adopt innovation and to work in open manner and which is why the open gateway initiative that we've talked a lot about this week and we launched only one year ago is so important because it's about making sure that we also instead of competing with each other we will continue to compete between each other but also collaborating to make sure that the value that sits in our network around safety, digital identity, anti-fraud, and there's many things that we are trusted partners for, for, for our customers. This is something that we do want to, to innovate on together, and it only works if we do it together because we need scale, and, and this is something that the, I mean, internet providers or the uh, over-the-top providers, obviously they look at scale, they, they come to Europe, through the internet and they can immediately reach all the customers. We are highly regulated at the national level, so we can only succeed if we join forces and build standards, and we are used to doing that. Collaboration in our industry, that's been the fundamental of roaming, GSM from the beginning. But we need to do it faster and in a lot more open manner. You've got some scale now in the Spanish market through a joint venture with Massmova. How do you use that model if regulators do not change their tune? Can you do joint ventures in other countries in Europe? And if you equally you did have regulators change their mind, what would consolidation look like under that context? Well, the process with, uh, for, the, for the JV with MassMobile, which we still work on closing by the end of Q1, it's been a two years process with the European Union and the Commission, the Antitrust Authority, to get the approval, the clearance, which we got last week, and we are pleased to doing so. We are becoming a leader in Spain. We are combining two companies. It's a JV. We have the option to take control of that JV in a few years down the road. So for us, it's very important. Spain is our second market. Now in that context, we're merging the number two and the number four in the Spanish market to create a strong number two or almost number one in terms of volume of customers. What's different in Europe is that every country is very different. If I talk about France, we are the number one in France. It's a four-player market. There's no way Orange can act as a consolidator uh, in France. Now, there are other places. Belgium, we just acquired a cable operator, and that's a market where actually there were only three players, but we are now creating a fixed mobile player in Belgium addressing the north and the south of Belgium. So, we are actively driving national consolidation, what's that's possible. We've done that in Romania as well one year ago. So it's really case by case, but it is every market is different and the antitrust authorities are really looking at the specifics of every market. Help us out with the 5G journey. Where are you at with deployment and when does 
5.5G and 6G come into the mix as far as you're concerned? Well, I think 5G was launched somehow too early. And we are just, I mean, now we've rolled out 5G in every country in Europe, and we have even launched it in the Middle East and uh, in some countries in Africa. But the reality is that 5G was launched when the devices were not available. And it took time for customers to replace their device and to adopt 5G-ready devices. So now it's ready, but the reality is that the real promise of 5G is on more B2B, B2, B2C type of business model. And it's going to be the ability to differentiate the use of spectrum to, to have a lot more efficiency. So the real use case today of 5G in our networks is to make sure we continue to have efficient networks for traffic that keeps increasing. So we need 5G for that. But in terms of value to customers, of course, you use a 5G with a 5G device, you get a fiber experience on your mobile. That's very important. But the main use case, at least for operators, has been to increase the capacity of our networks and to make sure we continue to swallow this increase of traffic. Is there a lesson here for AI phones, AI on device? Is that a use case that would spur more demand for your industry? Well, that's still a question mark because AI is consuming a lot of capacity when you train the models. But there's going to be, I mean, AI on devices, there's going to be AI in the cloud, there's going to be AI in the edge, depending on the use cases, what's going to use large language model, what's going to use very specific models. And we are testing all of that. There's real use cases around improving the customer experience when, I mean, and personalizing the offer and the response to customers. And that's something we're working on. There's also a lot of AI that we implement in our networks to, put up, to have more efficient networks. Now, this is AI, not Gen AI. There's a lot of buzzwords, of course, around Gen AI, and, and this is going to come, but probably not as fast as we anticipate because the models themselves are still being built and improved day after day by the big players. Help us out with some of the market hype because we're seeing it here at Mobile World Congress, we're seeing it on the stock market. How much of what you're seeing in some of these use cases are actually going to bring fresh revenue to companies? Well, it's still a big question mark because obviously the cloud provider, the hyperscalers, they see the revenues coming on their cloud infrastructure for us. For the timing, it's really more, I mean, improving the customer experience, improving the efficiency, improving the employee experience as well. But it's not clear yet that there's going to be a new revenue stream coming out of it. Can I also ask you about the Olympics? Because this is a big one for you in 2024. What do you need to achieve to have a successful Olympics? Well, you know, Paris 2024, it's a big event, the Olympics, and it's, I mean, once in a, in a century, actually, in France. We will be the only telecom provider when in Tokyo you had five telecom operators, so it's a big responsibility. But we have a unit at Orange that's called Orange Event that's used to supplying all the services for these big sport events. So we recently worked for the Africa National Football, I mean, Africa Football Cup. We used to, I mean, support many events in the past. So of course it's 1,000 employees at Orange working hard on making sure we connect all the venues. It's the equivalent of 30 Football Cup at the same time in Paris and the areas, and also connecting Tahiti and Marseille. So it's a fantastic project. It's going to be the best of what we know how to do, connecting also remotely and through 5G, by the way. I mean, the press, the media, the capturing of video. So that's going to be a tremendous showcase for all the latest technology. And some of that will be a legacy then that we will implement for other events in the future. Two more serious topics to cover off with you. Number one around the bank, Orange Bank. It showed great promise or great hope for diversifying revenues, but ultimately it seems like the lesson was that telcos can't crack the banking titans as you reverse out of this business model. What does it mean for diversification in future and the role of telcos in banks? Well, I think the Orange Bank was a great idea, I mean, almost eight years ago when it was launched. But at the time, we were thinking that digital banks would actually cannibalize traditional banks. And that's not what happened. And so we had a lot of energy put into it. But at some point, we had to recognize that we were not, we were not able to scale enough to make it profitable. And so that's why we look for an, an option. And, and we are now partnering with BNP. We made the announcement. Uh, uh, today and so we our customers will have a solution with uh, with BNP 
and we will continue to work with BNP to offer what's super important for telecom operators. We want to have financing solution in our store for telco customers. So we will continue to do so, and of course working hand in hand with the regulator uh, to, to stop the, the bank activity and working with our employees, of course, to, uh, to shut down the activity. Just finally, I want to ask you about the heightened geopolitics because the French president has not ruled out allies sending troops into Ukraine, which has just t turned the notch up on some of the tension around the war in Ukraine. What does that mean in terms of the safety of networks like yours that could be a potential area of attack, cyber attack for, for state actors? Well, I mean, networks are critical infrastructure. And that's why, by the way, we're so concerned as European operators that there's a framework, a regulation that's not allowing us to, enough, to invest enough in our infrastructure because these are critical infrastructure. And so at Orange, we have Orange Cyber Defense. So we have experts working day and day after to support customers and obviously working with Orange on protecting assets, protecting customers. Obviously the threat coming from attacks and cyber attacks is increasing day after day. Nobody's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, out of it. So we continue to invest a lot into this. And we live in a very complex geopolitic environment that's not going to stop. So we know that's an area on which we invest a lot and we will continue to invest a lot.